그럼 지금부터 장상수 아시아대학교 교수님을 잃어버린 20년 반면 교사로서의 일본이라는 주제의 특별 강연이 있겠습니다. 큰 박수로 맞이해 주시기 바랍니다. 네, 반갑습니다. 예, 방금 소개받은 에, 아시아대학교의 장상수입니다. 에, 저는 어, 뭐 저희 속담에 보면 은 서당께 3년이면 뭐 풍을 얻는다 그랬습니다만 은 제가 도합 10년째 지금 일본에서 생활을 하고 있습니다. 오늘 여러분들에게 조금이나마 도움이 될수 있는 말씀을 드릴 수 있도록 노력해 보겠습니다. 에, 최근까지 저는 삼성경제연구소에 근무하면서 좀 세계에 많은 기업들을 벤치마킹하고 그 가운데서 다시 최근에 일본을 보면서 좀 느낀 점들이 있어서 여러분들에게 말씀드리고자 합니다. <웃음> 아, 이러한 말이 요새 조금 관심을 끄는 것 같습니다. 일본아, 일본화를 하게 되면 과연 나라가 망할 것인가 이러한 어떤 의문인 것 같은데요. 에, 잘못 배우면 그렇게 될 수도 있겠죠. 에, 지난 음, 과거를 보게 되면 일본이 참 고도 경제 성장을 했습니다. 세계에서 보기 드문. 그런데 근래에 와서 한 20년 동안 경제 성장이 정체를 하고 있고요. 에, 그것을 벗어나기 위해서 지금의 총리인 아베 총리가 아, 아베노믹스를 선언했습니다. 아, 이 점은 좀 이따가 말씀드리겠고요. 그리고 고도 성장할 때에 크게 기여했다고 생각했던 일본적 경영이라는 뭐 3종의 신기, 예, 기업별 노조라든지 뭐 연봉 서열식의 임금 제도라, 종신고용 이러한 것들이 최근에 환경이 변하면서 맞지 않는 거 아니냐 새로운 것을 지금 찾기 시작했고요. 그리고 일본 사회를 이야기할 때 야마토 민족, 그래서 야마토 사회를 이야기합니다마는 최근에 보면 이제 갈라파고스란 말이 스스로들 입에서 나오는데요. 그만큼 글로벌화 시대에 거꾸로 해외의 어떤 에, 오픈이 되지 않고 이렇게 폐쇄적으로 가지 않느냐는 사성의 목소리가 있습니다. 그리고 일본에서 생산되지 않는 것은 수입하겠지만 그 이후의 과정은 전부 내부에서 제조를 해서 판매하는 이, 이것은 이제 지마의 슈기라고 하죠. <웃음> 뭐그 후에 일본을 나타낼 수 있는 것은 마츠리 최근에 뭐 사쿠라 예, 마츠리는 유명하죠 또 지역마다 마츠리가 있고요 그러한 가운데서 사실 한 섬나라지만 은 다양성을 볼수 있고요 그 다음에 아, 없는 것도 많이 이렇게 만들어내서 어, 교육자료로도 쓰고 하는 그런 부분이 있습니다 최근에 뭐 애도의 애절이라고 할수 있겠는데 그러한 부분이 이제 도덕 교과서에 실리기도 하고 이게 없는 사실이었기 때문에 논란이 여진 있습니다. 자 이렇게 보시면은 경제 대사 데이터 보시면은 음, 보시다시피 최근 한 20년이 아니고 25년 가깝게 거의 성장을 하고 있지 않는 상황입니다. 그래서 이것을 어떻게든 벗어나야 되겠다 해서 아베 총리가 취임하자마자 선언했고요. 그래서 2020년까지 2020년은 또 동경올림픽입니다. 그 해까지 500조를 600조로 끌려, 끌어올려 보겠다. 이렇게 선언을 하고 있습니다. 자, 한국이 과연 여러 면에서 좀 일본하고 사이가 안 좋은 게 있습니다. 제가 여기서 좀 말씀드리는 것도 조심스러운 게 그런 것인데요. 진짜 배울 것이 없는 것인지 이 점도 한번 짚어볼 필요가 있을 것 같습니다. 일본이 한국에 대한 어떤 이미지 조사 78년부터 해오고 있는데요. 어, 보시게 되면 은 특징이 큰 선상에서 보시면 은 정권에 따라서 상당히 에, 교차가 이루어지고요. 교차가 이루어지는 가운데서 사, 좋아하는 사람하고 그렇지 않다는 사람의 갭이 크게 점점 벌어진다는 특징을 볼수 있습니다. 바람직한 것은 아니란 생각이 들고요. 한편으로 보게 되면 은 무역 수지를 간단히 좀 보도록 하겠습니다. 얼마 전에 뉴스를 봤더니 국교 정상하고 나서 50년 동안에 누적으로 5천억 달러를 넘는 일본과의 적자를 봤다고 그러더라고요. 
그러면 1년에 100억 불씩 어, 적자를 본 것인데 에, 저희들이 에, 이러한 부분에서 좀 보더라도 어, 아직까지는 좀 음, 일본으로부터 어, 경제 경영 관점에서요 또 경영도 파고 들어가면 좀 이야기는 달라집니다만은 좀 배울 점이 있지 않겠느냐 에, 흔히 이야기하기를 뭐 노벨상 받은 사람들을 물리 화학이라든지 이런 쪽을 보게 되면 일본은 23명이 지금까지 받았다고 합니다. 뭐 그런 점에서 저희는 아직까지 한 명도 없으니까 아, 좀 배울 점은 여전히 있다는 저는 생각을 갖고 있고요. 뭐 알아야 또 이길 수 있다는 이야기인데요. 우리의 그 그동안 보게 되면은 뭐 과거 역사가 있어서 그럴 수 있겠습니다만은 대일이라든지 뭐 일본을 배척한다 또는 일본을 반대한다는 뭐 반일이라든지 그래서 최근에 오면 은아 일본을 드디어 이겨야 되겠다 어떻게든 뭐 거길 이야기를 합니다 그러면서 실제적으로 여러분 보시게 되면 은 제가 일본에서 이제 4년째 가르치고 있습니다만 은 유학생들도 상당히 많이 줄었고요 일본을 또 제가 삼정에 근무할 때도 보게 되면 은 저희 나라가 98년도에 IMF를 겪게 되면서 그 전에 사실 많은 일본을 벤치마크했습니다만은 그 후에는 저 자신을 포함해서 미국과 유럽 쪽으로 어 관심이 쏠렸었죠. 뭐 어쩔 수 없는 상황이긴 하지만은 저희가 만약 거기를 하겠다면은 제가 봤을 때는 일본은 알아야 될 것이고 좀더 나가서 뭐 친일한 말이 우리나라 상당히 안 좋은 의미입니다만은 가까운 사이에서 얻을 게더 많지 않겠느냐 서로 간에 그런 생각을 갖습니다 그런데 뭐 저희만 그렇게 한다고 해서 되는 것도 아니고요 또 일본을 보게 되면 최근에 너무 반한도 있고 최근에는 뭐 혐한이라는 말도 많이 있고요 이거를 그동안 많이 완화시켰던 게 우리나라의 젊은이들의 한류, 한류였고요 그런데 음. 최근에는 좀 활동이 떨어지고 있습니다만은 <웃음> 자 버블이 붕괴된다면 저희가 지금 어떻게 보면 많이 일본을 따라가고 있는데요. 버블이 붕괴가 되게 되면 사실 저희 국가 경제도 같은 운명으로 갈것 같습니다. 그랬을 때 지금 시점에서 일본을 알게 되면 배울 가치는 충분히 있지 않겠느냐. 지난 20년간 봤을 때 일본은 경제대국 2위였습니다만 그 사이에 사실 중국, 어, 중국에게 밀렸고요. 그 다음에 조만간 또 인도에 밀릴 거라는 전망을 하고 있습니다. 국내 사회에 보게 되면 은 경제가 정체되어 있었지만 은 그동안에 계층 간의 격차가 많이 벌어졌고요. 여러 가지 소득 격차도 벌어지고 어, 그런 가운데서 어, 사회 보장망을 확대해야 되고 그래서 재정적자로 어, 연결이 되고 있습니다. 자, 20몇 년 동안에 그러면 아베 총리가 최근에 아베노믹스를 선언했습니다만 은 그렇다면 그 전에 왜 20년 동안 못 벗어났느냐 제 나름대로 생각을 해봤을 때에 세 가지 관점에서 정리를 해봤습니다 첫 번째는 국가 전체의 어떤 정책의 문제가 있지 않느냐 어디나 전략은 있습니다 있는데 그 방향에 좀 문제가 있지 않느냐 하는 점도 지적을 합니다만 은 제가 봤을 때는 일본의 강점이라는 개선 활동으로 어, 그 연장선상에서 꾸준히 좀 나은 것을 택해보자 그러한 전략이 이 시대의 학령 변화에 맞지 않았던 거 아니냐 어, 경영학에 보게 되면 은 PDCA를 흔히 많이 이야기합니다 뭐 플랜 2 어, 체크 액트를 이야기하는데 에, 일본의 보고서를 잘 보시면 참잘 되어 있습니다 정리 잘돼 있고 어, 저도 많은 도움을 받고 있는데요. 그 다음에 기업들도 플랜에, 플랜에 따라서 국가도 그렇지만 은 실행에 열심히 기울입니다. 힘을 쏟는데 에, 당연히 실행을 하게 되면 중간에 잘 되고 있느냐 못 되고 있느냐를 체크를 해야 될 겁니다. 근데 체크를 하면 은잘된 경우는 문제가 없겠지만 은못 됐을 경우에는 어디에 누구에게, 누구에게 가는 책임이 있는 거죠. 근데 일본 사회는 공동적으로 집단적으로 의사결정을 한다고 합니다. 집단으로 의사결정을 했기 때문에 
책임을 집단으로 져야 되는 거죠 결국은 집단이 진다는 건 아무도 책임을 안 진다는 이야기입니다 제가 봤을 때에 체크를 해가지고 다시 개선으로 개혁으로 이어져야 되는데 그 부분이 좀 취약한 거 아니냐는 느낌을 받고 있습니다 두 번째 정치 쪽에 보게 되면 은 역시 저희 이 나라도 다를 바는 없겠습니다만 은 국회의 의회 정, 어, 정치가 너무 국민이라는 것을 의식은 하겠습니다만 은 정쟁에 쏠려 있지 않느냐 22년간의 일본의 총리를 봤더니 15명이 교체가 됐어요 그러면 은 심할 국면은 매년 바뀌고 있는데 일본의 관료 집단은 우수하기로 좀 인정받고 있죠 그 우수한 집단이 20년 동안에 다음 해면 은또 총리가 바뀌는데 예? 그러니까 복지 부동으로 빠지기 쉬웠지 않았느냐 그 다음에 매년 총리가 바뀌려면 뭔가 정책을 내밀어야 되는데 그 부분이 퍼플림 쪽으로 많이 흐르지 않았느냐 그 결과로 사회 복지에 돈을 많이 쏟아부었고 그게 지금의 OECD 국가 내에서 가장 많은 부채 국가로 정부가 부채를 지고 있는 현상으로 나타났던 생각이 듭니다. 경영 쪽에서 보게 되면 이 글로벌화를 상당히 지향을 하고 있는데요. 에, 종적으로 보게 되면 부서 간에 또는 뭐 비즈니스 유닛이라고 이야기합니다만 그 사이에 에, 커뮤니케이션이 잘안 되는 것 같아요. 제가 봤을 때. 어떤 의미에서는 이제 개파, 파벌 이런 것들이 보이지 않는 벽들이 있지 않느냐 물론 일본인 분들 스스로는 인정하기 어려울 것 같지만 은 어, 여러 어, 국가의 기업들이나 이런 것을 둘러봤을 때 크게 보면 삼성이 일본의 전자업계에 다 합친 것보다가 많을 때는 많을 때는 뭐 10여 배 정도 이상으로 이익이 많았죠 에, 과거에는 전혀 어, 이해도 이름도 모르는 회사가 제가 유학을 했을 때 삼성이라 그러면 솔직히 몰랐습니다. 그 미쓰보시라는 회사가 어디 회사입니까? 뭐 자기 나라에도 시골에 있는 회사로 생각했거든요. 근데 지금은 전 세계적으로 이름은 알려졌습니다. 그런데 일본 기업들로서는 삼성 때문에 쉽게 말 망했다 이런 관점. 에 그게 최근에 파나소닉 같은 데는 뭐 신년 응? 모임할 때에 뭐 타도 삼성을 부르짖고 이게 이제 확대가 되면은 한국에 대해서도 관심이 좀 음, 이미지가 안 좋을 것 같습니다 근데 제가 봤을 때는 자체적으로 이러한 문제가 있지 않느냐 저희들도 이러한 것들이 이 형성이 된다 그러면 은 미래는 밝지 않겠죠 그래서 집단으로 이루어지고 전임 사장이 후임 사장을 임명하고 그 다음에 부서 간에 에 벽이 있고 이렇게 해서 제가 봐서는 의사결정 스피드가 늦은 것 같다는 생각이 듭니다. 예, 이 그림 잠깐 보시면 은 매니에다 일본의 총리 재임기관이고요. 그 밑에 뭐 저희 헌법에서 오연식 보장받았고 아래쪽이 이제 중국입니다만 중국도 짧아지는 경향이 있습니다만 은 일본은 너무 자주 변하지 않았느냐 이렇게 볼수 있을 것 같아요. 아베 총리가 집권해서 이것을 타파하겠다. 일본화를 좀 없애고 일본을 다시 부흥시켜 보겠다. 해서 아베노믹스를 선언했습니다. 저는 개인적으로 봤을 때 상당히 좋은 방향으로 한 것은 방향은 참 좋았다. 그런데 의욕도 높았고요. 그러나 지금 4연째로 접어들고 있는 현 시점에서 봤을 때는 일본 국민들의 평가가 그렇게 높지 않습니다. 그 점에 대해서도 좀 뒤에 말씀드리겠습니다만 일본은 집권하자마자 아베 총리가 아베노믹스를 선언했고요. 이 아베노믹스는 잘 들여다보게 되면 은 저희 나라 전임 대통령이었던 이명박 대통령 때의 경제정책하고 거의 유사합니다. 더 쉽게 말하면 일본의 아베노믹스는 일단은 경제부터 재형시키고 놓고 나서 그리고 이 그러기 위해서는 기업체들의 여섯 가지 무거운 짐을 좀 덜어줘야 되겠다. 그리고 순서는 첫 번째는 본인들에게 지런 이미 확보되어 있는 거니까 
좀 양적으로 접근을 해서 양이라는 건 돈을 많이 풀어서라도 일본의 돈 가치를 떨어뜨리게 되면 수출, 제품 가격은 낮아지기 마련이기 때문에 가격 경쟁력을 먼저 올려서 기업체들의 수익을 개선해야 되겠다. 그 수익이 바탕으로 돼서 길게는 새로운 가치를 만들어내는 그런 기업으로 가야 되겠다. 왜? 기초기술은 갖고 있기 때문에 네, 충분한 어, 좋은 시나리오입니다. <웃음> 자, 여섯 가지 짐이 이런 거죠. 양적 완화, 환율, 최근에 마이너스 금리, 돈으로 일단 해결하는 음, 하나의 첫 번째. 이거는 효과를 거뒀습니다. 그런데 너무 길어지니까 약발이 지금 떨어지고 있는 느낌을 받고요. 에, TPP 체결. 저희 이명박 대통령 부지런히 전 세계 다니면서 2개국, 3개국 간의 FTA를 맺었습니다. 일본은 그동안에 상대적으로 이 부분이 좀 음, 적었고요. 이한 큐에 끝내겠다는 관점에서 12개국의 TPP에 넓게 뛰어들어서 지금 큰 줄기에서는 합의를 받습니다. 하지만 미국 대통령 선거가 있고 일본에도 참여한 선거가 있고 등등 시기적으로 물리면서 지금 약간 유보된 상태고 법인세는 일본이 상당히 높습니다. 30한 6, 7% 되는 것을 최근에 29%대로 낮췄습니다. 전력비를 인하해야 되겠다. 전부 다 기업체의 가격 경쟁력을 높여주는 시책이거든요. 그런데 원전을 재가동해야 되겠는데 이것이 지진 3.11 지진 이후에 원전에 대한 그 원자력 발전에 대한 국민들의 저항이 크기 때문에 좀처럼 속도를 못 내고 있습니다. 뭐 환경 규제라든지 노동 규제, 노동 규제도 어떤 부분에 있어 가지고 혁신을 하고 자지만은 사실 후생 노동부의 저항에 부딪히거나 좀더 많은 재정을 투자하고 싶지만은 일본의 재무 재무성, 일본 재무성으로부터 또 저항에 부딪혀서 그렇게 순조롭게 가는 건 아닙니다. 그래서 초창기에 이런 성장세를 보이다가 최근에 와서 좀 꺾어진 그런 현상을 볼 수가 있습니다. 국민들의 어떤 그 조사를 보게 되니까 지난해 10월 달부터 해서 최근까지 보게 되면 은 상당히 높았던 것들이 조금씩 낮아지고 있는 것을 볼수 있습니다. 예. 이것도 하나의 뭐 조사기관이 한 거지만 은 음, 극단적으로 보면 은 초창기에 60% 넘었던 것이 최근에 30%까지 떨어졌다. 반대로 지지하지 않는 게그 60%대로 올라섰다. 이렇게 볼수 있겠습니다. 자, 요지는 왜 평가가 안 좋은가 하는 점인데요. 에, 상당히 의욕이 셌습니다. 그리고 국민들 전체가 호응을 했죠. 아, 이대로는 안 되겠다. 아, 그런데 기대가 너무 높았던 반면에 성과는 너무 늦게 나타나는 것 같습니다. 막 우주의 위성을 쏘올라도, 쏘아 올린다 그러더라도 공개도 오를 때까지는 힘이 에, 바탕이 돼야 될 텐데 그 부분이 좀 시간이 지나면서 점점 추진력이 약화되는 것 그리고 언제까지고 돈을 풀 수는 없는 거 아닙니까 혹시라도 실패로 끝난다면 엄청난 부채만 쌓이게 되는데요 두 번째는 이 유형의 어떤 하드 측면에서만 너무 신경을 쓴것 같아요 제가 봤을 때는 기업들이 새로운 어떤 가치 창조 저희도 지금 자, 뭐 제4차 산업혁명 이야기합니다만 새로운 어떤 가치를 만들어내려면 시스템도 바뀌어야 되거든요. 예, 더 쉽게 말하면 저는 인사를 쭉 삼성에서 20몇 년간 했기 때문에 인적 자원관리 측면에서 본다 그러면 평가 체계부터 바꿔야 되고 채용부터 바꿔야 되고 그 털이 모두 바뀌어야 되는데 그 털은 과거 20년 30년 전에 또 그분들이 20, 30년의 분들이 지금 다 윗자리에 앉아 계시고 지금의 제도와 시스템이 편하고 그래서 저는 시간이 앞으로도 많이 걸릴 것 같다 그 부분에 대해서는 지금 거의 손을 대고 있지 않습니다 저희들은 97년도 IMF가 일어났을 때 한번 대한민국 전체로 참 크게 바뀐 적이 있었는데 최근에 보게 되면 은안 바뀌려고 엄청 노력하시는 것더라고요 이 트리클 다운을 많이 이야기합니다. 하는데 보면은 크게 와서 왼쪽에 있는 쪽이 부분은 성과를 거뒀죠. 많은 덕을 봤습니다. 아베노믹스라는 바람이 불고 나서 덕본 쪽하고 전혀 아직까지 덕보지 못한 쪽. 
내수 쪽과 중소기업 지방도시 그 다음에 비정규직 원래부터의 저소득자라든지 저성과자 우리나라도 저성과자 퇴출 문제가 논, 논, 논의가 되고 있습니다만 은 일본에서도 2000, 음, 2000년대 후반부터 이 점이 상당히 이, 논란이 되고 있습니다 자, 아베노믹스도 들어오고 나서 노란 줄을 보시게 되면 은 이게 지금 비정규직의 상승률이거든요 그리고 오른쪽에 있는 것이 비정규직하고 어, 정규직 사이의 임금 격차입니다. 연령차별로 연령대별로 상당한 차이가 지금 나고 있습니다. 여기에 쓰여있는 바람이 불면 물동이 장수가 돈을 번다는 게 일본 속담인데요. 예. 이 예전에 바람이 이제 티끌이 있는 말이죠. 어, 티끌이 눈에 들어가서 결국은 에, 염증으로 뭐 봉사가 된다. 봉사가 되면 먹고 살 길이 일본의 사미세들한 게 있습니다. 깽깽이라고 하시면 그거를 치면서 어, 구글 행위를 하는데 그러려면은 그 깽깽이에 이제 싸는 가죽이 고양이 가죽이었답니다. 근데 고양이를 많이 잡으니까 천적인 지가 늘어나고 지는 물동이를 나무로 있으니까 깎아 먹게 되고 결국. 이 물동이 장수가 번다는 이 상당히 인과관계가 긴그 관계를 나타내는데 아베노믹스로 인해 가지고 어, 번 쪽하고 벌지 않는 쪽 예. 모든 정책에 이런 음, 양면이 있겠습니다만 <웃음> 자 마지막으로 저는 여러분께 과연 반면 교사의 어떤 교훈이 이, 이것도 뭐 저희들이 받아들여야 만이 교훈이 되는 거지 예. 싫다고 생각하면 은 전혀 효과가 없겠죠 근데 자세히 보게 되면 일본을 닮아가고 있습니다 저희가 사회적으로 예, 뭐 고령화 속도 어, 가장 빠른 나라로서 2050년 되게 되면 일본하고 거의 비슷한 수준이 됩니다 뭐 저출산 일본을 이미 초월했죠 저희가 OECD 1일 겁니다 아마 예, 그 다음에 저희들의 어떤 그, 어, 뭐 고령자 관련 문제나 사회복지 문제 이런 거 보게 되면은 재정적자 관련해서 이런 부분이 상당히 많이 닮아가고 있다는 생각을 갖습니다. <웃음> 자, 제가 30년 전에 유학을 했습니다. 6년 동안. 예, 84년에서 90년까지 됐었는데 그리고 이번에 갔습니다. 갔는데 그동안에 일본 분들하고 지난 3, 4년 동안 쭉 이야기를 해보면서 느꼈던 점이 이첫 페이지에 쓰여 있는 겁니다. 이거 어디에 나오는 것도 아니고 뭐 어쩌면 일본 분들은 아니라 생각할 수도 있고 여기 계신 분들도 어, 나는 그렇게 생각 안 하는데 할수 있겠는데요. 첫 번째 제가 봤을 때는 겸손함과 어떤 자신감이라든지 뭐 아래에 나오는 거지만 구심력 이런 부분들이 여유가 사라진 것 같아요. 에, 예전에 좀 이야기를 하면 은 이분들이 웃으면서 뭔가 이렇게 설명도 하고 여유가 좀 있는 폰인데 최근에는 겉만 그냥 정색을 하고 예, 심하면은 뭐 바로 그냥 디베이트로 들어가가지고 조금 그런 마음의 여유가 사라지지 않았네 하는 거다 그죠 두 번째는 일상생활에서 느끼는 건데요 과거에 뭐를 부탁을 하면은 직원이 진짜 고객 제의진한 마인드가 있었던 것 같아요 그래서 안 되는 것도 뭔가 어떻게 하면 은 이분에게 해줄 수 있겠냐를 몸으로 느낄 수 있었거든요 최근에 젊은 사람들 거기 저 가게 가보면 은 하는 게 이야기하면 아 이거 우리 이 지, 회사의 규정 매뉴얼 먼저 그거 찾습니다 찾고 나서 아 이거 안 됩니다 그냥 매뉴얼대로예요 지금 한국 사회도 매뉴얼 많이 만들고 점점 그런 쪽으로 가고 있는 것 같은데요 이거는 상당히 제가 가서 통장 만드는데 반나절 걸리죠 핸드폰 저기 개통하는데 반나절 걸려요 대한민국 그런 데 있습니까 지금 네. 물론 어느 쪽은 그 일본 사회는 안전을 택하고 저희 나라는 속도로 택하고 이런 게 차이점이 있습니다만 뭐 어느 쪽을 택할 거냐는 어, 뭐 선택의 문제가 되겠고요 제가 봤을 때는 이 글로벌 시대 속도가 저희 말 경쟁력인 이 시대에는 맞지 않는 거 아니냐 그 다음에 개인주의가 젊은 사람들 중심으로 해서 상당히 심화가 됐고요. 20년 동안 침체가 되면서 나부터 먼저 좀 살아야 되겠다는 게 말은 안 하지만 은 집단주의고 하기 때문에 말은 안 하지만 은 그런 게 보입니다. 저성과자 퇴출 문제가 논의되고 등등하면서 그런 것들이 엿볼 수가 있고요. 
그래서 이제 두 페이지 마지막 남은 겁니다. 예. 제가 봤을 때는 에, 아까 일본인이 한국에 대해서 느끼는 친근감 조사를 아마 보셨을 겁니다. 상당히 그 교차가 돼 가지만은 좋아하는 사람과 나빠하는 사람 사이의 갭이 점점 커지고 있는 걸볼수 있어요. 그런데 그 일본 분만 그런 게 아니거든요. 예. 한국 그게 설문조사를 보더라도 마찬가지일 겁니다. 예, 그래서 최근에 일본을 너무 뭐 일본 사람들도 한국을 잘 생각하지 않는 건 있어요. 어, 그 사람들은 어쩌면 한국을 괴롭으로 생각할지도 모릅니다. 예, 버리긴 아깝고 가깝게 하기에는 뭔가 뜨겁고 예, 그렇지만 은 저희들은 에, 좀 제대로 알고 그 다음에 친구 많이 만들어서 서로가 같이 상생할 수 있는 그러한 쪽으로 나가야 되지 않느냐 하는 생각을 갖습니다. 그런데 그동안 보면 은 일본이 너무 하드에 치중돼 있었고 지금까지도 어 하드 쪽에 관심이 가 있지 않느냐 네, 그래서 소프트라는 건 저는 사회적인 조직 문화라든지 어떤 가치관이라든지 이런 쪽입니다. 그런 쪽에 있어가지고도 좀 빠른 어떤 변화가 있어야 되지 않겠느냐 일본적 경영에 대해서 잠깐 말씀드리면 은 벌써 시대는 지났습니다 옛날에 고도 성장기에는 제조업 중심이었어요 만들면 팔리던 시대 일본은 품질도 바탕이 되어있기 때문에 그런 시대였습니다 하지만 지금은 그 시대는 아니거든요 만약에 제4차 산업 무선과적 시대가 된다고 하면 은이 일본적 경영이라는 이 시스템은 제가 봐서는 상당히 작동하기에 한계가 있을 겁니다. 아마. 그래서 지금도 연공주의 인사 시스템이 많이 잔존하고 있고요. 그러한 부분을 성과 창출이라는 새로운 가치 창출이라는 데 포커스를 맞춰서 평가 지표도 밝혀야 될 것이고 그러한 사람에 대해서 우수한 어떤 보상을 해야 될 텐데 그것이 좀 그렇지 않다는 것을 엿볼 수 있습니다. 조직 문화 중에서 모두에 말씀드렸습니다만 아직까지도 갈라파고스라는 게 강합니다. 여러 가지 다중의 종, 어, 종행의 어떤 문, 어, 장벽이 있기 때문에 커뮤니케이션이 단절되고요. 어, 4차 산업 시대가 된다면 제가 보기에는 가장 중요한 게 지식 정보의 네트워크이고 그것의 흐름일 겁니다. 특히 속도가 될 것이고. 근데 아직까지도 그러한 장벽들이 너무 많이 존재한다. 우리 한국 사회도 솔직히 이런 부분 많습니다. 지금 최근에 국내 기업들 부설 기관이 이런 쪽 보게 되면은 연구소들도 좀 민감한 이슈에 대해 가지고 보고서 자체를 뭐 발표하지 않고 이렇게 되는데 그 국민들에게 지식적인 차원에서 얼마든지 오픈해도 되겠지만은. 네? 언론에서 확대 재생산, 재생산하는 경우도 있고 그러한 것들이 다시 때로는 여의도의 국회의 도마에 올라서기도 하고 그렇게 하게 되면 점점 몸, 몸 보신주의로 빠지거든요. 그래서 좋지 않은 일본의 관행이라고 그럴까 한 이런 부분은 저희들은 제발 담지 않았으면 하는 것이고요. 그 다음에 이 섭정경영이라 제가 써놨는데 한자로 이게 CEO를 하다가 그만뒀으면 은 제가 봤을 땐 그렇습니다. 오랫동안 하면서 그 순간에 그만두는 순간에 회사하고는 솔직히 좀 음, 그 발을 끊는 게 좋다고 생각이 드는데 일본에서는 고문, 뭐 상담력 무슨 해가지고 계속 위로 앉아있어요. 회사에 그 후배가 아무리 사장이더라도 전임 사장이 지명을 했고 그러니 또안 모실 수도 없고요. 그 후에 부회장으로 계시거나 또 회장으로 계시거나 거기다가 대표 이사권까지 갖고 있단 말이죠. 그러니까 같이 갖고 있는 거죠. 변화가 있을 수가 없는 겁니다. 그래서 저는 지배구조 문제도 중요하지만 은이 후계자 석세션 플래닝에 대해 가지고도 상당히 관심을 가지고 그러한 부분은 일본에 절대 닮아서는 곤란하겠다는 것하고 마지막으로 인재 육성이 있어가지고 좀 말씀을 드리겠습니다. 일본에 가니까 이 글로벌 인재라는 게 
핫 이슈가 되어 있어요. 그리고 어, 문부성에서 엄청난 예산을 쏟아붓습니다. 대학교 쪽으로 등등. 하지만 뭔가 방향에 좀 어, 의문을 제 갖게 하는 부분이 있고요. 왜 그러냐면 그 부분이 민간 기업들이 왔을 때에 육성을 해가지고 시장에 내가 진출할 것이냐. 그렇지만 이미 육성하는 기간에 경쟁 회사들이 외국의 경쟁 회사들이 시장을 다 점유해 버린다면 의미가 없어요. 그러니까 시장을 먼저 포커스에 두고 나가지고 인재를 확보할 것이냐, 키워서 육성할 것이냐, 회기를 해야 되는데 선택을 좀 해야 되는데요. 어, 삼성은 그런 의미에서는 어, 확보 쪽이죠. 그러니까 중도 경력 사원을 많이 확보를 했죠. 1년에 만 명을 채용할 시대에 2, 3천 명, 3, 4천 명을 별도로 경력 사원들을 채용을 했으니까요. 일본은 그 점이 거의 없습니다. 최근에 일, 저기 저 일본에서 공부한 대조 사원들을 채용한다 그러지만은 그 사람들이 성전하는 데 있어 가지고는 남녀의 어떤 그 천정 뭐 유리라든지 이런 유리 천정이 있다는 이게 아니고 일본에서는 제가 봐서 외국인들에 대한 다시 내부에 그러한 보이지 않는 에, 천정이 있는 것 같습니다. 이런 부분이 있어 가지고 어, 한국하고 좀 다른 점은 있지만은 좀더 어, 인재 육성 이런 부분에 관심을 가져서 저희가 어, 어디 이 아까 말씀드린 뭐 거기로 하겠다 이런 생각은 가능하면 안 갖는 게 좋아요. 제가 봤을 때는 상생해서 같이 간다 이런 생각을 하셔가지고 접근을 하셔야지 저희가 뭐 거길 이런 말 쓰게 되면 상당히 그분들이 듣는 사람들도 상당히 기분 나쁩니다. 예. 제 강의는 이상으로 마치겠습니다. 예, 감사합니다. 다음은 인공지능 활용의 특별한 용처, 기업 퍼포먼스를 높여줄 수 있는 혁신 알고리즘이라는 주제로 연사들의 발표 및 토론을 들어보도록 하겠습니다. 큰 박수로 맞이해 주시기 바랍니다. So there are so many things to be gained. Fraud can be brought to a minimum in the most uh, 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 positive scenario. A lot of possibility has opening up for doing business when we think of um, artificial intelligence. This session is all about getting a current status um, on this interesting topic. With me, I have five very competent panelists, um, three speakers and two guys to challenge them and ask all the right questions. Um, the first speaker will be Kamal Joshi. Kamal is country head of uh, Tata Consultancy Services. Tata is one of the world's largest companies, an extremely innovative company. Um, he will touch upon where are we right now and hopefully also a few cases from Tata Consulting where they are working with big corporates on artificial intelligence. Then uh, we move a little closer. Patrick Curry, I think you are, you are number two in the line of uh, uh, 
Oh, maybe I'm switching around. No, I think I'm right. You're just switching seats. Um, Patrick is director of British Business Federation Authority, but don't be fooled. Um, he's a nerd. He's an expert. So he will give us a status also on all the all the pitfalls, all the things where we could go wrong. And then, Marcel, you will be giving us actual examples from accounting, the challenges of uh, uh, automization of uh, accounting. So I look forward to all these three brilliant speakers. And then we have a venture capitalist on the side who is actually willing to put his money where his mouth is. Um, Todd van Norde from Caden in, um, in Holland. And then we have Gerald Yao. You actually walk the talk. You are um, founder of a company actually working with artificial intelligence in legal services. So these two are competent guys for getting the best out of this interesting panel. So come on, the floor is yours. that I can run this. A clicker. Okay. Seems like I'm set. Anagasio. Good afternoon, my uh, friends. Uh, I have been in this uh, country uh, since the last one year. And I have found this country to be amazing. A, from what it has been able to achieve in the last 40, 45 years, which is unparalleled. And two, the recent activity which happened where a company called Google came here and challenged one of your champions on Go. While everybody was very happy that, you know, the concept of artificial intelligence seems to have come to light and everybody wants to talk about it, what I found really interesting is to see what has really happened behind the scenes. If you look at what Google has been able to achieve through their program of AlphaGo, they have worked on this project since 2014 and have taken cue from other companies which have attempted to automate this program and bring it to the champions of Go such that there could be a machine and a human competing at the same level. Of course, Google used the concept of Monte Carlo tree-based search and <laughs> deep learning. But more importantly, it had to make the whole AlphaGo go through at least 500 games before it could make it achieve what it has achieved. So you have to look at what is the comparison between the effort put in by Google to a human being. Ladies and gentlemen, that's just the beginning of what artificial intelligence can offer. And of course, what I'm trying to and going to achieve today in my next 15 minutes is in terms of what are the key factors which we have to keep in mind, which is essentially with respect to the quantum of data. That's what AlphaGo had to go through 500 programs to learn it. In terms of what artificial intelligence probably is today and how it will keep on evolving itself, it hasn't evolved as what I'm effectively saying, and what could be some of the challenges which this intelligence in technology should essentially also look at solving, in my opinion. Does this work in some way? Uh, I'm going to start with four points, and I'm happy for you to read what is mentioned there, but I'm going to give you a perspective. We all know that the military sites and NASA is supposed to be the best on technology. And while they are using a technology in a very constructive way, there are people who can also use it in a different way and hack it 
as many as 97 times in 13 months. While there is going to be a huge rise on robotics and artificial intelligence, don't get it wrong, but we are also looking at 5.1 million people probably losing their job as well. Also note that the world population is becoming 9 billion, but at the same time, in order to feed all these people, 50% more crop has to be created. And the genetics, the science of genes, is also looking at doing gene editing to make new types of genes. This is what technology has come to, and it's going to probably continue in this way. So what is really happening? Digital is being default. My company's view essentially is we started with what we call as derivative innovation. We have moved from there to incremental innovation, and now we are looking at disruptive innovation. That's the trajectory in which technology is trying to encroach into the lives of the corporates and into our lives as well. Just to keep, pick a couple of examples, we all know that Uber is the largest taxi company, but it doesn't have a taxi by itself. Airbnb is the largest hotel group in the world, but doesn't own a property. Autonomous cars, everybody's talking about it, but is it going to only impact the people who are going to have driving experience? What about the insurance industry? What about the energy industry? Will it have an impact on that as well? And of course, we all know about 3D printing. We all know that they, it is already being used for creating new kinds of shoes and as well as airplane parts. So if you look at it effectively, we are looking at the digital forces coming at play and more specifically, as we have all heard of the top four, I'm going to mainly focus on how artificial intelligence and robotics effectively is impacting and changing our business. New business models are coming about. It's giving rise to new products and services. We have seen Uber and Airbnb, where it has been ability to start a business without any investment on properties or cars, but merely a portal and that itself drives the whole business. A new kind of customer segment is coming out, which is called as one segment. So it is very specific to you as an individual that organizations are trying to focus on. So one individual is a customer focus. So one segment is becoming the focus. New kind of business processes are being formed. There are a lot of focus on regulations and compliance. How to address those regulations and compliances at the same time ensure that you can use technology to make your business more agile and more competitive and be current to what the market is going to expect between today and probably next 20 years. So how is AI effectively driving the business? There are different aspects which are coming into play. You have decision making where you can use or AI is being used. Forecasting, which has been a long thing, which has been, which is using um, artificial intelligence. Operational risk, workforce management. But I being an IT company, let me take a minute and help you focus on how we as an IT company are looking at IT operations as a key focus and where artificial intelligence is coming into play. So if I take an example of one of the products which we have brought into the market called Igneo, we are the first company bringing in a neural automation system which is enabling the enterprises to use it with very simple implementation, very quick turnaround time, seamless adaptation to your system, thereby giving you an ability to create what is a context which is essentially for a business based information and actions which can help you to mitigate a lot of existing and forthcoming issues <laughs> and a proactive information which can enable a lot of risk and challenges when you really have a disruption. So the concept that we have used effectively is neural networks and deep learning which enables it to understand what an enterprise is like and how our system can give a customized service to that business from its current world to help it attend to the new world. We know that artificial intelligence is cutting across different industries. We all know about the chatbots. 
we all know about Google cars, we all know about how the new gaming systems are coming about. And we are also seeing that this is being applied in different industries in different way. You pick up different industries right from healthcare to transport. Deep learning, machine learning, and artificial intelligence with neural networks is very commonly being used. And we are all very familiar about the terms of Internet of Things, Internet of People, Internet of Everything. All these are combined together to effectively give you one thing, which is a better efficient corporate, which can be, which can utilize this to give you better services to you as a consumer. So you with, with that as a background, which gives you almost like what is the current state looking like? If I look at the crystal gaze and just see what the future probably could be like, I'm looking at what we probably all have seen before, the Kurzweil curve, and if I superimpose the Moore's law of how the computing power, essentially the number of transistors which can be plotted in a given dense space, effectively is going to move about. We probably today are at the narrow intelligence phase. We are looking at probably in some time gaining a general intelligence, which effectively would be that the computers and the technology will enable it to start thinking like what a human being is able to think. And then probably in another 15 years, look at how technology can provide you means of being one step ahead of probably predicting what could go wrong as we human beings are able to do looking at more from a super intelligence standpoint. So that's the curve that we are looking at when we are sitting in very in interesting times from where we are with respect to technology. I'll give you an example. Till yesterday, the data which is humongously available to all of us was supposed to be interpreted by we as human beings. But don't get it wrong, we are now looking at the machines trying to tell you what is going to be tomorrow like. This sentence out there is actually created by a machine telling you that there has been an earthquake, it has been reported, and the intelligence clearly shows that the difference between a human mind and a machine mind is coming very close to each other and that could be a big advantage for the mankind. Moving on, and let's look at what probably could be the future looking like from that standpoint. We are currently looking at artificial superintelligence. Can it be a threat to the human existence? I think we have heard Mr. Elon Musk, we have heard Bill Gates talk about it, and of course Stephen Hawking talking about it, that they fear how artificial intelligence probably could be a threat. We all know that technology does not have any emotion. We know that technology can be manipulated to behave in a wrong way. We also know that we have to prevent it, and there could be malfunctions because of which. So what could probably be the answer? It's all that we collectively have to look at what is the optimized artificial intelligence, which could be of the best benefit without causing us the distress, which probably a technology could cause. So if you mirror a human mind, or if you mirror a human being, effectively what it is, it's nothing but an ability to store a lot of data, an ability to sense, and convert that sense into our emotion, and based on that, give a response. And we, because of the evolution that we have, we have a huge amount of memory from what we have in childhood. And of course, as some of you believe in soul and God, it kind of goes much back in lifetime. And of course, with all this combined, the brilliance that we have to put everything in a context, so essentially a contextual brilliance. Now, if you want to mimic something like this, using technology, you have to have a very clear architecture. An architecture which tells you that you have to codify what we can classify as a good behavior. We have to be very careful that technology will also face the challenges of what we can term as a bad or a defective behavior. 
So we have to be careful in terms of how we are going to code it and how we should give the ability to be prepared for what could be the new challenges of defect and be having the system to be ready to learn by in itself. And of course, most importantly, as I have mentioned before, data, because there's huge amount of data being generated today by different industries and different ways with sensors. So can we put all this data so as to match what could be a good behavior and respond to what could be a bad and defective behavior? In my personal opinion, I'm looking at three key areas which I would really want technology to look forward and help us solve. We all know that world population is growing and we have to look at how quickly can we have food available for everybody. We are looking at South Korea where we have a huge penetration of mobile. The income is pretty high for everybody, but we also have countries, continents like Africa, probably India, which do not have or have shortage of food, but have a huge population. So that's one thing which I'm really looking at. Could aeroponics be one of the solutions? Because as the cultivable land is reducing, could that help us? Could that technology be help us doing that kind of thing? Cleaner environment. We all know that Google is developing a car. Could that help us create a cleaner, greener environment and not fall into the trap of having a lot of carbon monoxide and our next generations will have a huge challenge to deal with? And of course, with all that being done, I'm pretty sure you in Korea know that the lifespan in people in Korea has definitely increased in the last 30, 40 years. And today we are already looking at the lifespan of close to 80 as an average age. With technology, can we look at that being provided to everybody in the world? How can that be delivered with safer environment, cleaner environment, and enabling healthcare to help everybody to address this. I will end this session with something which I have personally experienced with respect to a complex event processing, which is turning out to be one of the core solutions to very tricky problems which the world is facing. And I'm picking up an example, of course, of a bank, but this is just a simple representative example which could practically be extended to human life. Now, in this particular example, of course, uh, traders have a lot of information with them while they're trading. And how machine learning and complex event processing enables to capture any leak of information, thereby disrupting a financial system. Friends, that's pretty much what I have to share with you today. Uh, summarizing once again, three key things. One, data is being generated all over the place. It is very important to con contextualize and make use of the data. Technology is increasing at a very rapid pace. The essence is, can this zillions and petabytes of data can be contextualized and used for the right purposes in the right businesses? And third and most important, while technology is very good and very powerful and we all enjoy, can it help us solve problems which we all know are really waiting for a very good solution? Khamsamida. Well, thank you very much, Kamal, for giving us an overview, showing us all the potential solutions that we have ahead of us. Patrick, now let's take a deeper dive into the bits and bytes and the challenges. We've heard a lot about unicorns. You can believe in the myth, you can live the dream. The reality is that we live in herds. That's how we survive. We work together in communities, and if you want to be an outlier, you're either very, very good or you die. So the world I live in is in helping make a lot of the dream work. And this is a digital dream, and this is about digital societies and digital economies. And the problem is, this is complicated. This is not for salesmen. And the point is, in the digital world, that it comes down to considerable detail. A Dutch colleague of mine told me one day, the definition of the internet is it's a place that you can do truly dumb things on a vast scale, very quickly, and you can't get it back. 
In other words, when it's gone, it's gone. So you need to be really careful about the risks that you are taking. As humans, we make decisions in our daily lives in a physical world about risk all the time. We do it naturally in everything we do. But when we go on the internet, we don't have the benefit of thousands of years of experience. And so the internet today is a relatively unsafe place to go. I'm going to come back to that, but I'm going to focus in on just one area today, which is to do with data, because that's what this is all about. We make decisions. The quality of those decisions as organizations and as nations and as people depends on the quality of the information. <coughs> Imagine a situation that you are an airline pilot. You'd lost contact with air traffic control and the maps that you have are now changing in front of your eyes, like in Harry Potter. You probably would be very, very concerned about the safety of yourself and the people in the back of the aircraft. So it's really important in this interconnected world that you have a connection and you have the data, and that data means something to you and everyone in your community. That means you have to know who other people are and who other organizations are. So this comes to identity. How do I know that you are who you claim to be? Who can give me the independent assurance that you are who you claim to be? And that can get extremely difficult. So I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey now through something called the Uniform Economic Transaction Protocol, which is a new international protocol to link the different elements of data in different processes together with identity and with trust. And I should be here with a colleague of mine from FOCAFET, which is the organization behind UETP, but I am from an organization called BBFA, as Klaus has already explained, and I am going to extend uh, what we were going to discuss on UETP, and I'm going to make it more relevant to Korea and the opportunities for Korea based on some things that your government is doing. So, FOCAFET is a not-for-profit which is behind UETP, and my organization is another not-for-profit, and we are involved in many, many aspects to do with trust, and identity, and cyberspace, and cybersecurity. So there's quite a long list here. I'm also involved in privacy and surveillance. And I'm involved in projects in the EU to do with internet governance and the Internet Governance Forum. But we're dealing with a lot of change, and part of this change is to do with new technologies and new laws. So we've had some significant laws in Europe and we're going to see more in other parts of the world about identity and about privacy. There is no privacy without authentication. There is no authentication without identity. So these new technologies are very exciting, but we need to use them with care. So I've put on the bottom there blockchains and distributed ledger technologies, and these are ways in which organizations can see the same information in near real time without error and in a tamper-proof way. This is completely new. So to give you an example, last week I was looking at a beta uh, solution called Settle, which would clear the transactions for the City of London, for the financial transactions for the back office in the City of London, 
which is normally around 145,000 transactions a day. Settle would clear each of those transactions, which normally takes a day, it would do that in 15 seconds. And that is money paid right through. So this is transforming the nature of the economy. But we need to be able to control that process. So let me now start to talk about UETP, because the core of this flow is data, financial data, asset data, entity data. So today on the internet, we rely on the internet. Most of the younger generation today don't know a world without the internet. We have 7 billion people on the planet, 1.8 billion of those have no identity. They have no digital inclusion. The UN strategic goal, 16.9, is to give those people an identity and make them digitally included. And the target is to achieve this by 2030. That's going to be difficult. Which means the internet needs to be a safer place for us to work. We need the internet to be able to support economic business in a way that it cannot do today, and it needs to have the trust mechanisms to support those. I've put a lot of detail in these presentations. I'm not going to go through the detail, but I offer it to you uh, because it may be useful information. Now, most of you will be aware also that we have really three kinds of web. We have the normal regular internet that you can search, the deep web, which is much bigger, which is where the data exists that manages the internet and the data that is on the internet and supports search, and a place called the dark web, which is an area where there is no ability, um, easy ability to search, and it's an area where anonymity is uh, available. Now, that can be very good in some societies, but it can also attract people who want to do bad things. So if there's, no, if there's anonymity, there is no governance. No, financial systems require governance to operate or they fail because people abuse them. So the dark web is not really a good place to go and do legitimate business, but it is good for illegal business. So it has no governance on the dark web. So what we need to do is to find a way on the economic internet to have that governance, which means we must have adequate data between all the organizations. Now that data's got to be in the detail. And it's not just about payments, but it's about who makes the payments, all of the different kinds of entities involved, that are doing the interactions and transacting. So we've now got to capture each of the transactions for different kinds of products, things, or services. And these entities can be machines themselves or devices. And they can also, of course, be people and organizations. Now, every entity in cyberspace binds to an organization. And today, the biggest issue that we have in cyberspace, all of our systems, our mobile phones, our people in cyberspace, they all connect to organizations. On average, over 70% of organizations that are financially active in a developed nation are not registered in that nation or they're not registered at all. As a consequence of that, it is really difficult to have trust in the people and the devices associated with that organization. So organization is really important. So together, all of these come together in an ecosystem or a collection of economic communities. So there are three things that one needs to be able to do. We need to be able to connect. Can you physically connect? Do you have 
the ability electronically, digitally, to be able to interact. You need to be able to understand. So are you using terms in the same way? Is your language and data sufficiently interoperable that when I say something in a language, in, in a, a computer system, your system will understand the same thing? Does customer mean the same thing? Does account mean the same thing? And I need to be able to transact. And when that process happens, I must be really confident I'm transacting with the right person in the right situation and that that is a legal transaction. It's not prohibited for some reason in some jurisdiction. So UETP is a data uh, identifier protocol that links these different aspects together. And it's down at this unique identification that's so important, so that's the first point. I can then link attributes or pieces of data that I can trust to that identifier. And I can put that in a directory service or a database that others can discover and use. And we call that DNAS. So here you can see, uh, this is what the unique ID that is in uh, UETP looks like. I'm not going to go into the detail, but you can see it's a 256-bit string. But it has in there a timestamp, so timing is really important. And it has a node identifier. That means different places can generate this identifier, uh, this um, UUID. But it can only come from an approved node. And we use similar models for things like barcoding, for example, for products. In uh, the digital environment, if we're talking about networks, we traditionally talk about the OSI stack, as it's called, which you see on the right-hand side. And that goes from the physical level at the bottom, through the network, right up to the application which you use. And there are technologies, which you see shown in the middle, which help to make those work. What's missing is this top layer where we can manage identity for the transaction. So I've added this top layer for the entity because identity is so important. And there you can see the UETP protocol. So that's how it fits into the stack to help us to create identities and then to bind those identities, the information, together with the entity, the thing, and information about the thing so I can manage it. So here are some examples. It could be about people, organizations, physical assets, blood products, for example, or an aircraft part, a machine. It may involve payments, so there's different kinds of money. It could also include rules of how this can be used. So it might be subject to international traffic and arms regulations for export control, in which case, this access could only happen if you're licensed. So that would be in the rule set legal, for example. It might be for age verification because it's alcohol or a weapon or a controlled product. Or it might be for reasons of tax, as I'm showing here. And so all of those come together, potentially, within a, with a transaction ID, which can be held in UETP. So how does this help us? Well, on the left, you see a traditional model. You can see the kind of activity for the buyer and the seller with the banks, what we call a four-corner model. You can see a, a three-party model for logistics. And you can see uh, also the buyer and seller interaction with the authority. But the problem that we have here is those are all separate. So that there's multiple pieces to the transaction which are not connected. So UETB brings this together almost in a social network, but at the data level. So if I look at it a different way, on the left-hand side, traditionally, we connect these systems using APIs. 
But on the right-hand side, we're now using data to provide that interoperability and connection rather than this complex spaghetti that we have on the left. So I give you a simple example here. Yes, it is simple. On the right, you can see a receipt for something. You've bought something, a product. It's $10. There's a discount. There's some tax on there. There's a total. There is information underneath about the transaction. Who, when, where, and maybe there's some other information with approvals, for example. And in the yellow, you can see descriptions of all of the pieces that make this up. So is it trusted? How can I check it? Where can I check it? All of that information can be contained in a UETP transaction, which can then be discovered by all of those other parties, those other organizations that need to know. You could apply this to IoT, to Internet of Things, or Internet of Everyone or Everything. Who am I? What do I want? What do we do? This is what I can do. The answers to those questions can be put into the protocol. So you can see here some more examples. It's generating um, interpretable information, interpretable data, which is itself based on standards for international standards organizations for authentication, for example, or GS1 for part marking. So now I have the ability to start to link all the parts of complex transactions together in one place. And this has additional advantages in things like supply chain finance. So today, one of the biggest problems is that the buyer of something often has difficulty in providing collateral to the seller's bank. So the buyer wants to be, he has to buy with credit and he, and he has to provide the collateral for that. And the seller needs to make sure that they've got the finance to be able to support that. Today, that financing process uh, can be difficult. What happens in a UETP environment is everybody sees that. So the bank seller gets to see what the buyer's collateral is instantly. And so at that point, the, pro the transaction can complete very quickly. And very importantly, the friction is reduced, which means there is a possibility of a lower price. Completely different example, cross-border management, which is a really difficult topic at the moment. But you can see, shown here, whether it's cargo or you want to look at things like export control or fraud, uh, or you just want to do operational tracking for delivery purposes. There, there's a very broad scope here. In other areas, regulatory compliance. We've talked a little bit about regulatory compliance in the enterprise, but actually, most compliance risk today is what happens outside your organization because you're dependent on a cloud provider or suppliers for critical parts. So authorities need these capabilities to be able to trust the other organizations in their supply chains. And as new regulations come in from major economies, particularly United States, for cyber assurance, we're going to see more compliance requirements. And that is going to affect how uh, the compliance of uh, payments and financial transactions are executed. So I put this example in today. DNAS is under development. That's why it says envisaged but we are looking at different parts of the world. And um, I do have colleagues here in South Korea who are involved in looking at implementing DINARS in uh, Korea. But UETP relies on supporting capabilities. So I'm showing DINARS here as a transaction register. There needs to be registers of the organizations and the attributes, the data associated with that. And we have a specification for that internationally, and it's the register of legal organizations. We also need to have identification of individual devices to be confident that those devices aren't spoofed. And there is new technology coming into uh, devices which will make them even more trusted than they are today. So I need to be able to connect all of those at a transaction level. 
Now, one of the things we require for that is certificates that help us with signatures and encryptions, and they come from a certificate authority or a CA. But we have many CAs. So if they work to the same policy, I need to link those together, and I do that with something called a PKI bridge, or I can connect them directly. This gives me federation. This gives me interoperability across communities, nationally and internationally, and legal compliance. So I'm now beginning to get trust together. Now, we already have PKI at scale. UETP's in a pilot today, I'm mentioning that in a minute. And we have initial capabilities for Rollo. And within Korea, I know the Rollo specification has been taken to advisors of the Supreme Court. So these discussions are happening. And device registers are out there, but they're going to become more available um, to the communications organizations to validate them. Now, this is an example. This is a PKI um, view, and I've put a UK bridge in the middle. What you can see there is CertiPath. That is the aerospace and defense bridge. Every international airport in the world and a lot of the maintenance activity that happens with the big name suppliers there leverage, use CertiPath credentials for access control and to support things like uh, flight planning. On the right, you can see Safe Biopharma. That is used by the pharmaceutical industry for aspects of pharmaceuticals, drug trials, and more, and starting to be used for health. And governments use this, so I could put other governments. I've listed some in the top left up there, right the way through to organizations like NATO. So we need these high assurance credentials, these certificates, to help us with the cryptography that makes uh, gives us the ability to rely on our digital data and to encrypt it and have confidence with who we're dealing. So if I shrink that down and talk a little bit about here in Korea. So KISA, the Korean Internet and Security Agency, runs certificate authorities and it does some for the government and it does some for industry. And the industry ones you see here, they issue certificates or can issue certificates to every company in Korea. But if other organizations outside Korea want to work with Korea in this same model, they need to federate. In other words, they need to be interoperable. So I'm showing on here, there's a discussion that started about linking Korea into this trust model for identity and for signatures, and for encryption, which would provide a huge increase to the ability for Korean businesses to be trusted internationally and other international businesses to be trusted in Korea. So I've now shrunk my orange certificate authorities there, and I've put on here in orange, the, in yellow, my Korean certificate authorities with Kika, for example, and there's a requirement to build a Rollo for Korea with attributes in there for every single legal organization with a level of trust in it based on international standards. And that would provide a basis for a lot of what we're talking about on digital transactions. So today, Kika has 33 million credentials issued inside Korea. That's more than the population. So this is very pervasive. So I said I'd finish with a little example uh, for UETP. So UETP is being used on some ships at the moment to track individual bricks and um, some other components between Tilbury Port in London and the Port of Rotterdam. And the cargo is literally intelligent which means that the information associated with it, which is placed in a blockchain, so you can't tamper with it, but it's updated every couple of minutes, means that if there's any change in the cargo, everybody gets to know in this very great detail, and they can change the ordering system within a matter of seconds. 
so that when the ship arrives at the next port, it's all, all the distribution is taken care of for a new order. So you are changing the orders and all the payments and all of the taxation and all of the rules. All of that process is happening in a matter of seconds or a few minutes. So the cargo becomes independent and it's dynamic between all of the locations and the organizations involved. So to put it another way, on the left-hand side, traditionally, I would have had my applications that would have interacted and then put information into servers. Now what we're seeing on the right-hand side is interaction between the entities driven by data. And that comes down to being able to use sensors to help you in the physical world and link that with the data that is held in DINARS and Rollo and so on. So by way of conclusion, it's enabling all parties to participate in transactions with transparency and trust. It enables compliance, and we're getting more compliance, because of things like supply chain interoperability, so we can understand each other, which means I can reduce costs and risks significantly. And I can do this flexibly because I have dynamic smart contracting involved. And this gives me the ability to support new requirements like IoT, which means that banks can leverage this in connection with payment activities. Korea is in a great position to exploit these developments, but the challenge we have is executive awareness, educating the people in management that make decisions. This is a problem we're finding around the world. So I ask you in this room today, um, I hope this information is useful to you in briefing your bosses and raising your understanding within Korea. Thank you. Thank you very much. Patrick, you, um, you started out by frightening me a little bit about talking about security, but you actually ended on a good note. We are working on it. We have the protocols. Um, so I'm glad you took things in that order. Um, now, Marcel, you are, you are a little bit closer to taking this towards business. You will look at how real-time bookkeeping is evolving. And we had a little discussion, and we say, aren't that here already? But no, we have digitalized analog bookkeeping. Real-time bookkeeping is a much bigger advancement. So please enlighten us. Okay. Can it be heard? Yes. Thank you. Um, I learned a few things in the last days, um, especially about globalization 4.0. So I'd like to take you on a journey about accounting and auditing 4.0. Um, accounting sounds very boring, but it is really necessary for globalization 4.0. There can't be truly globalization without compliance, accounting, auditing on a higher level than it is today. We really need that. We can't be successful on the other aspects as we have seen the last you know, hours and yesterday. I like to bridge the world of accountancy and innovation. And that sounds strange, but hopefully after 20 minutes you understand my proposition. Let's see this one. Yeah. Let's go back to bookkeeping. <laughs> um, we want to go to bookkeeping 4.0, but what was bookkeeping 1.0? In the 15th century in Venice, bookkeeping was invented. And I have to look up the name for the guy, Pascioli, and he wrote a book, and that book was the basis for bookkeeping as we use it, so I would say, for some decades ago. Some companies, some small companies, might still use the bookkeeping 1.0 and do it by hand. Most companies, however, are conducting bookkeeping 2.0. They have a single standalone financial system and they do the bookkeeping in that. In the past, it started off with mainframes. Big corporations could do bookkeeping in mainframes. Then we can minis, then we had PCs. So more smaller and smaller companies went 
to the next generation of bookkeeping. Nowadays, especially in the Netherlands, most bookkeeping programs are in the cloud or you have an ERP system. So that's the current status and I will call that bookkeeping 3.0. The current status means that you can produce reports and mostly, most companies, companies produce reports based on PDF. And PDF, as we all know, has a language. And I can't read the Chinese PDF. Maybe you can. Maybe you can read the Korean PDF. I can't. You can't read my Dutch PDF. My Dutch yearly figures, you can't read it. So we need something else. We need a globalized booking si keeping system. We need something which can keep up with globalization and globalization 4.0. We need auditing 4.0 and we need also compliance. A lot of companies struggle with compliance. And yesterday I learned from a company, uh, a huge corporation, acquired a lot of banks and had to sell off banks again because they had compliance problems. So compliance is something which is really, really important to be successful in the globalization 4.0. And I like to emphasize on auditing, compliance and auditing. So I was curious uh, about the audience. Um, maybe I hope you can understand my English translated very well. I have some questions. Could you raise hands if you are a CFO? Are there people being a CFO in this audience? Nobody. Wow. C -E -I, CEO, the head of the board. It's only a few hands. I'm surprised. I expected to have more CFOs and CEOs in this audience. Are there accountants in this audience? <laughs> if I would do the same talk in the Netherlands about innovation, accountants are often the front runners of innovation. They come to the companies, they go to the board, they advise the board. So I would expect that accountants from your country, Korea, would sit here to learn about innovation. So I'm really surprised that I don't see any accountants. Let me ask another question, and it's some slides uh, forward. Extendable business reporting language, XBRL. Who has ever learned or worked with XBRL? I don't see any hands. I looked it up, and some week ago, the 21st of April, there was a conference hall on XBRL here in Seoul. Unfortunately, I couldn't make it. But it means that there's also some things going on in Seoul and in Korea. I couldn't read the pages because they're in Korean. So I have no clue what currently the status is of XBRL in Korea. I'm really curious. So if somebody can tell me afterwards, I'm really delighted to have a chat. Um, one more question. I'm going to talk about an enterprise service bus which is might be a little bit technical. Who's ever worked, seen, or had to make a decision to buy an enterprise service bus? Maybe the translation is slow? <laughs> and all big companies in the Netherlands, all have some form of enterprise service bus. It's a vital DNA of the company. So I'm surprised that the audience is not aware of the phrase of ESB or Enterprise Service Bus. Uh, I could ask more questions, but first let me introduce something about myself. Maybe you expect that I'm an accountant. Maybe you expect I'm an auditor. I'm not. I'm an IT architect. I'm an integration exp expert. And I'm teaching service-oriented architecture, business process management, and XBRL at several universities. And XBRL is being taught at the accountancy department. And my next slides will be taking you on a journey what's XBRL about and how important XBRL will be for every company in the world. Glo XBRL is a global standard. You can't get by it. So everybody at some stage, maybe I'm the first one to tell you 
at some stage, you will learn the phrase XBRL. And maybe you don't know anything about it, and maybe you will not learn how much about it, but at some stage, it will change the way the company is controlled. And the main thing for now is how can we cope with compliance? How can we put compliance in the area of, uh, let's say, the 4.0 globalization? This is a nice elephant. I always use them. For every college I have, I take out the XBRL, put something in there, I can always use it. So what is XBRL? This is the what. The next slide is the why. So what is it? And I have to look about sometimes, but I know a lot about XBRL. So I will first do it out of my head and then complete it from the list. XBRL is a reporting standard. It stands for Extendable Business Reporting Language. It's an XML-based standard. So everybody sees it the first time, says XML, it's easy. It's, it's in my career, and I've seen 2,000 protocols, the most difficult protocol I've ever encountered. It's a multi-dimensional metadata definition. It is very rich. Functionally, it's the most rich semantic standard you have seen. So from functional perspective, accountants have chosen a very difficult standard. And now they are confronted that they have to comply and to implement these standards everywhere in the world. And my talk is also within the DNA of your company. XBRL is defined by a taxonomy. A taxonomy is a data set which gives you all the metadata of reports. And for instance, you can have a fiscal year report or you could have a tax declaration report. So XBRL is defining metadata of all kinds of financial information. It provides, the why, it provides transparency. And I have to speed up a little bit, I see. I can talk for hours. I normally teach it in nine weeks, XBRL. So I do it now in two or three slides. So normally it takes three weeks to have a basic understanding. So don't be uh, confronted with that you think, oh, it's a lot of information. But remember the transparency. It provides transparency about your financial information within your company and within, between companies and regulatory agencies. <coughs> it is a sort of normalizer of financial data. And as I said before, it's worldwide standard. So within Korea, you will, as a company, be confronted with it. Maybe only within Korea, but if you do international business, and you have to be compliant at some stage in other countries too. I was in a conference, XBRL International Conference in Copenhagen a while back, no, I think a few months back. And then I met the Ministry of Transport of China. China has adopted XBRL and will be a massive implementation expected in the coming years. So if you do business with China, can't be compliant with XBRL, you might be out of business. Let's talk about the two main characteristics of XBRL. We have two distinctive types. We have like a snapshot. It gives you a financial report. And the financial reports are often dictated by regulatory agencies. In the Netherlands, we have the SBR, the Standard Business Reporting Program. And there, the Tax Authority, the Center Bureau of Statistics, and some Chamber of Commerce and others are working together. and they a demand from every company from 2017 onwards, they demand financial reporting. And all other parts are taken out. So you no longer can send an email with a PDF of your yearly report. You can't. And one of the problems with XBRL is not human readable. So the Dutch are ahead of this and they have invented a an, an standard that is called unified um, uh, and normalized normalized view, and it's dictated by the Dutch National Bank. It's a layover on top of XBRL, so everybody, even if you look at PDF or you look at Excel 
or you look in the HTML, will have a unified view on the contents of the XBRL message. That unified view is dictated by the metadata, the taxonomy. GL is my next thing, global ledger. It means that every transaction within your company is XBRL based. So if you got a mobile phone and I pay something, we have two transactions. I might be a company and I buy something from another company. Then I send an XBRL message within my company and the receiving side sends an XBRL message in their company. So and then this message is accessible everywhere within the company. So we take out, normally you have the, the bookkeeping system, the ledger, and the ledger and the bookkeeping entries are tied together. Now we're taking out that part and we, we take it apart into a message bus. But first, my presentation is about continuous auditing. And what is the, for accountants, the main big thing different than before? It's that they are no longer in a continuous, um, let's say you have a, a website and you have a, a lot of uh, uh, ships moving, a lot of freight trucks moving. All your goods are not in one single warehouse. In the past, an accountant went to the warehouse and started counting things. You can't do that anymore. You have to rely on figures. But an accountant can't rely on the figures if he doesn't know how the process is being built. So accountancy is shifting from data control to metadata control. How is the process being made to create the data? Um, and we will see later, we have things like rules engines. So we take all the knowledge of the accountants out of the head of the accountants, put them in to a rules engine, and then accountancy is about exception. Let's say somebody buys something in a shop at three o'clock in the night, and the shop is closed, because the shop closes at 11. That might be fraud. Somebody might have broken in, maybe an employee, and might have done something suspicious. So we take that out, and accountancy, an accountant is only going to look at those transactions which are out of the normal. And this platform is about big data or artificial intelligence, complex event processing. So also we want to have the whole of all the transactions into a big data soap. Uh, how does it look like? Um, ESB, Enterprise Service Bus, this is a very interesting slide because I've put a company forward, a global company, and they have headquarters, they have divisions, and they have branches. Can I point with this? Any, anybody know how? Okay. Maybe this? Yeah. So here's the headquarter. Here, I will do it here. Here's the, 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 the branches. Sorry, the branches here, divisions, headquarters. Let's say a point of sale is somewhere here. And then it goes in the local bookkeeping system. And normally you would do BI and send a report here. They do BI, send a report here. But it takes for ages when the information goes up. What we have seen in companies, we have some global players in the Netherlands, that they had here the headquarters in the Netherlands. They have here a cash keeping system in the US and they have a branch in Mexico. And Mexico is full of corruption. So they lose out a lot of money due to the corruption. How much? They don't know. But if every transaction becomes a an, an GL-based XBRL message and put onto a message bus, and a message bus has to uh, 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 decouple the, the journal entry from the bookkeeping system, then you can subscribe on it from any point. So an, let's say on corporate level, an accountant can, can temporarily or continuously subscribe on bookkeeping records. And you can find out that in Mexico, certain departments are frauded and others are not. So you can take action. It gives you management information. But another thing important as well, we have these regulators. They all want the taxonomy. They all provide us with the taxonomies and they all want uh, XBRL FR, financial reports from us. And that means if you're a global uh, uh, player, you have to provide these local reports. In the Netherlands, we ask reports. In Belgium, they ask completely different reports. In Germany, the same. Every country in Europe asking reports. Do you want to build business in all these countries? You have a lot of 
trouble to get compliance with all these compliance regulations. I was teaching it for several years, and then I realized we have to do it different. So what we are looking at, and I see when the time I move on, um, we use business process management, we use rules engines, we use big data, and we put it on top of a service bus. That service bus is, can I, is this back? What is back? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, as you can see, we receive a lot of XBRL GL messages, and we have to file in a lot of XBRL FR reports as well. But you don't want to have automated reports sent automatically to a compliancy. You want to have a look at it. So where would you take a look at it? You take a look in a BPM system. The BPM system, we have created XBRL viewers and XBRL editors. And as said before, the Dutch uh, National Bank has created a standard for unified viewing. So our components do a unified view on an XBRL report you have to file in. And you can alter it, you can change it, you can edit it if you think it's wrong. And sometimes you have the figures in millions while you have your, your mapping in the ESB is wrong and it has, it has to be thousands. So sometimes you have to correct things. But if it is correct once, then you can rely on it, then you can automatically start automatically sending it on. And nowadays we send once a year something to our tax authority. But uh, if I talk to the tax authority in the Netherlands, they want to move up. They want maybe in five to 10 years, they want every month want a financial statement of me. They want to tune in to my financial system and tell me you have to pay so much um, taxation. Big data, this is about all. So big data, you have the historical XBRL. So you could see what was it next year, the last year and the year before, but also you can compare all your branches. And what I didn't mention, I didn't mention a lot about uh, XBRL, is that XBRL is language independent. So in the big data soup, I can compare the things from China, things from Korea, with the things from the Netherlands and the things from Germany. So I now have a way of creating accounting for that O. And with applying rules engines, I can say a rule of, of in the Netherlands, I can say a rule if you have a, like a, a, a uh, paid somebody too much money, there is, you have to pay additional tax, a, a person. That's a rule, I can program it, and there are some, some uh, complex uh, rules in it, but uh, finally, I can run through every company in the Netherlands on my laptop in 10 minutes. We have 1.2 million companies, apply the rules, and all the companies, I can apply the rule in 10 minutes. I don't need an accountant anymore, I only need the accountant for the exceptions. So what will happen? There will be a lot of demolishment of jobs in accountancy. Expected job loss only in the Netherlands, 400,000, in Europe, 5 million. Is that a bad story? No, it isn't, because they expect in the EU 5 million new jobs for accountants with XBRL knowledge and big data knowledge. Now, one last slide. I'm from Plumitco, and we created all these components to sustain this story. So we have looked at it and we built an XBRL processor and we have built a lot of components, see it like Lego blocks, supporting um, XBRL and with drag and drop capabilities without any program, you can create the story I just told you. And I would have loved to speak 45 minutes, I would have loved to speak five days on it or maybe 10 days because I'm teaching this and only on XBRL I can talk through the whole of your conference but my time is up, so I hope you learned something, and I hope if you've got questions, come to me. And I have written a book, unfortunately in Dutch, um, but maybe my next book will be in English and you can read it as well. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Marcel. At least I got two very important checkbacks. I like your way of explaining this as we are breaking down the language barrier in accounting. I can't read a Dutch language, uh, or, uh, I can't read a Dutch uh, um, invoice or an, a Korean one, but in, lit in this language, everyone would be communing, uh, communicating in the same language. Correct. And then another important take back, if you want to do business with China, you need to be able to communicate 
in, in, in XBML. So these are definitely two important takebacks for me. Now, to our two panelists, you were not accounting, uh, accountants, you were not CFOs, so you share that with the audience. What kind of questions do you have to our panel? So my first question is, um, the topic of regulations came up quite a bit in um, each of your talks, so I'd be curious to hear, what are your opinions on the optimal role of government in like each of your topics? Um, I think by putting out regulations, it's clear for companies what they have to comply to. So on um, that matter, I, I'm a favor of uh, more regulations. Uh, we see that as well in the Netherlands. We also look now looking at social security, pension funds, and all regulations on reports and regulations on providing a first day uh, employee report in XBRL for your pension fund and or for social security. So we're looking at 2,000 new standards which are obligated by the government. And regulations is not about what you have to comply to report to, it's also the standards they set out. Is that a yeah. little bit an answer on your yeah. question? And I'd love to hear from Patrick and Kamal as well. <laughs> <laughs> so um, governments, uh, where they really help is first of all, uh, working with other governments to make sure that you don't have legal differences between different countries because that makes international supply chains and financial systems really difficult. And if I look back five years ago, may maybe a bit more, I remember talking to um, SWIFT and they were saying in San Francisco every week they had a different regulator coming to audit them and all the audits were different. So it was really, really difficult to try and satisfy this rainbow of conflicting requirements. So the first thing is governments, you need to work with each other in a global context to provide a legal and, as you say, I completely agree, a standards baseline based on international standards, please. The second big thing you need to do is to help with market adoption. So you, that means helping with education raising awareness amongst executives. In many of these areas now, particularly where we're looking at penalties, uh, there's a requirement to make sure that uh, there is new insurance mechanisms to cope with risk, uh, so that when you get fined, there's some way to deal with it, because things will go wrong. And this, the last piece on, on this is part of adoption is you put it into contracts if you need to. So government suppliers, you make it a requirement for all your government suppliers to be compliant as well. So, Tom, what, 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 what's on your mind? Yeah, what's on my mind? A lot, actually. I've, I've <laughs> learned a lot today, <laughs> especially on the, on the last subject. I, was, uh, I can say I'm a, I'm a novice on FinTech on this deep level. Uh, first of all, thanks for all the speakers, insightful pitches. But I was wondering if we zoom out a little bit and look at artificial intelligence. My question actually is for Kamal. So you talked about the promise of AI. What do you actually find the most inter uh, interesting development? I think the most interesting uh, development that I find personally is with respect to how uh, the fundamental things which were probably existing in terms of how mathematics and the different concepts which were existing all this while are now beginning to be available in a codified manner to solve very interesting challenges which we always dreamt of solving by using it. So I think that's, in my personal opinion, a very significant shift uh, which technology has enabled for us to make use of from an in artificial intelligence or basically as a technology intelligence standpoint. And I'm, I was wondering what you see if when uh, ecosystems or industries get information enabled, uh, then stuff of disruption happens, right? I was wondering what, what's in your opinion the next big industry that will be disrupted by the future of AI? Well, uh, I, I really hope I would be such a wonderful crystal gazer, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'll be wrong in my prediction, but I really believe that one or two areas which I really feel I believe artificial intelligence should help us solve problems is to try and bring technology available with everybody. So today, if you look at it, 
the world has been better connected with the availability of mobile phones. So I heard a lot yesterday about finance being made available to many people. I think the digital environment can enable a lot of things to be made available and I think that probably is going to bring a lot of consumer related revolution in the market. That's, that's my uh, personal take on it, which can be probably exploited by different industries in their way. So retail probably is one area as I see it. Yeah. Uh, Patrick, I was wondering your thoughts on the subject. So uh, the one I would really offer is health. Uh, health touches everybody, at least we hope it touches everybody. We're living longer and the requirements, we, we have continued increasing expectations. Um, and so what we're finding now is a lot of medical systems uh, are able to detect uh, problems long before a doctor would traditionally see something. And doctors are increasingly in short supply as well. So I give you an example of a pilot that was done some years ago, and it was based, the technology was from the Netherlands, but it was done in the United States, 200 hospitals, and they concentrated intensive care capability and they used a lot of medical systems. That resulted in a 28% uh, reduction in lives lost and a 32% reduction in costs. So you spent a lot less money and you saved a lot more lives. Um, but we're not very, we haven't learned the lessons from that yet. So I, th I think the technology is really good. We just need to be harnessing it better and we need to be more aware. So we need companies like Tata to do more, please. <laughs> Get it accepted. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick, you spoke about the Internet of Things in relation to ships, but it also applies to like medical devices. Um, I'd love to hear more on like your thoughts on the Internet of Things in relation to health. And I also for Kamal, um, you spoke about just the problems that AI um, will solve and just how it applies to the Internet of Things as well. So my reaction is the Internet of Things is already here. Um, we talk about it as if it's something that's going to be coming. And, we've, and some people now talk about Internet of Everything because the salesman has got tired of Internet <laughs> of Things, so he wants something new. Um, the critical thing on the Internet of Things is we've got devices that interact directly with each other. So they can be off-grid. So, uh, and I think this is really interesting. In Korea, uh, they are deploying IPv6 and also what we call LTE4, so that's like 4G, but it's a variant, LTE4E, which allows you to work between, directly between mobile phones. You don't need a base station, which opens up a lot of opportunities. So if I can do that, I've got NFC in my phone. Why can't I talk directly to my um, my wallet system, and I can talk directly to an RFID that's in a device or whatever. So you're going to see some of that kind of intelligence going into devices now. Uh, the challenge that we have is that we need to get the security component in there as well so that you know that you're talking to the fridge, not the toaster. Otherwise, there might be an argument because, <laughs> of course, the toaster is really hot and the fridge <laughs> is really cool, and you wouldn't want a cool toaster and a hot fridge. That was a joke, but it didn't work. <laughs> it's not <laughs> working for me. <laughs> so uh, my reaction to it would be, uh, I think one area which is rapidly evolving uh, is what we call as a smartphone. And in my personal opinion, I think our phones being called smart is not actually smart. Uh, I don't think so. A smartphone is smart enough because it actually doesn't know what I want. And uh, the ability that a smartphone can offer to an individual who's carrying it is humongous. In terms of understanding what I want and deliver it to me when I need it is what I believe the recent set of innovations are showing moving in that direction. So I feel that's one area which probably I believe should rapidly come about in the coming future. So come on, how far away, how far away are we from that moment? <laughs> <laughs> Ask Kamal asking, asking what he wants. <laughs> if I were to have an answer of it, probably I would be starting a company tomorrow. <laughs> I'd be very rich. <laughs> well, I think the technology is there. And I think with uh, the so-called devices which everybody carries called smartphone is available for technologists 
entrepreneurs, venture capitalists to invest and create a new business model for Indexel. So we are already at that juncture where we can make use of it and exploit it. Uh, who does it? I'm pretty sure there is some unicorn in some part of the world who's already thinking of the next best idea to convert this into a big business. Yeah. I, I would like to throw in a question. Um, I'm glad that the panel is uh, very positive. It's a, it's a good note, but to monitor progress, it's also good to uh, uh, look at the barriers. What, in your opinion, are the biggest barriers? We were touching upon health and to get to get knowledge out of the genetic revolution, we need to share data globally. And people think that DNA is something that you keep private, for instance. But, but what, in your opinion, each of you is the biggest barrier for getting all those uh, positive outcomes that this technology uh, uh, holds? Uh, yeah, anyone. Um, <laughs> one of the problems in uh, connecting information is that you need to be sure what the information means. And the data of data is called metadata. And the more we can standardize the metadata, the more information we can get out of things. At the current moment, we have a lot of data, but also a lot of metadata, which is incomparable. So it makes it really hard, even if you put it in, uh, in technical things like Hadoop, and you start doing things on the technical level to find words or keywords to compare it with, if your metadata is more aligned, you will get more out of it and you will, you will make a quantum leap. That's my personal opinion. Thank you. Any other comments on the barriers? I think the barrier primarily is the human mankind in itself. Uh, because what we see in technology from one side of the coin also gives rise to another view from the other side of the coin, which effectively means that what sounds very good may be not very good for somebody else. So there are different schools of thoughts which keep on emerging and how the world will start converging to understanding the power of one is what will be one of the biggest barriers for us to make the best use of how technology is radically evolving and make it to use, as I mentioned in my thing, what I would term as a good behavior. Yeah. To put it at work where it solves the real issue, like food, uh, 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 health, etc. Yes, yeah. and not be scared that technology uh, could be difficult and may not be used in the right hands, but at the same time, use it in a positive way for the right purposes. The good mm. challenge is the dichotomy. Um, in other words, uh, you, you can't have everything for free. It doesn't work like that. Um, and so we're in a world where Darwin was right, and uh, you need to be really, it's survival of the fittest, and if you want to be irresponsible or stupid, then you're probably going to put yourself in harm's way. So if you're going to be smart in a digital environment, whether you're a person, a consumer, citizen, whether you're a company or whether you're a government, the most important thing is awareness. And if you're not aware, you won't know what you want. And your phone certainly won't know, be able to tell you. Um, and if you're not aware, you can't manage the risks and you can't, uh, you, you can't get the benefits that you can get from the, the wonderful opportunities that we've got. Tune, uh, Gerald, any uh, final questions? Um, you, you just spoke about ethics. I'd be curious about, like, what do you think are the greatest challenges that some of these companies will have to deal with in terms of compliance and being able to, like, know maybe what they don't know right now? You ask me now? Yeah. It's an open question. Uh, I will, will <laughs> try to get an answer. If I look at Europe, for instance, uh, one of the biggest challenges is that there's a lot of uh, compliance standards coming out which they're all like agencies or EU platforms, but they are not aligned. So you might have to file in to a certain area and then profit is defined as number seven. And then the same profit is defined as number 10 somewhere else. It's like uh, from a list. So that means that as a company, 
and for every report, for every compliance thing I have to do, I have to make something unique, and that will drive a lot of cost. Uh, compliance means that I will set out my data, and, and the more the compliance requesters are standardizing the, the data, which they do, by the way, in the Netherlands with an SBR program, the more you get alignment, the lesser the cost, the easier it, it gets to be compliant. Got it. Good question. <laughs> yeah, I was actually wondering, for all speakers, is what will be your key takeaway? What did the audience really need to take home uh, on the subject that you discussed? Come on. So what I would... Oh, oh sorry. sorry. Uh -huh. You go. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, simple takeaway. This is a step change. This is a wonderful opportunity, what's happening at the moment. It's like a wave coming through. You need to be on the wave or it will go. And you do that by collaboration, which is why we've come here. If I look at how things probably can stand today with what technology has been able to achieve in the last 10 years, which it didn't achieve in the previous 40, 50 years, basically gives me a sense of that the opportunities which we as, and I'm putting myself in the category of young people, can probably achieve is humongous. Not only to look at it purely from the purposes of creating new business models or making more money, but being able to solve and bring together communities and societies which can be put together as what we call as a one world kind of a thing, uh, which essentially goes back to the point, yes, collaboration between what you do in Korea, what can be achieved in India, what US and Europe has to offer, can it be taken to Africa? So that's what would basically, uh, I would like to see as technology trying to achieve with the help of all of us coming together. Well, I think that is a wonderful note to end us uh, end on that that big data is actually something which will bring all parts of the world together. And what I like, none of you mentioned that we are pretty much all parts of the world are joining forces here because we have seen other technologies like GMOs where Europe is lagging a little bit behind. We are afraid of the technology. And it's, from my perspective, nice to hear that we are not at least no, nobody mentioned it, that, that, that we are at different levels here. We are all working on, on, on common standards. So I want to thank the three speakers. I want to thank the two panelists for sharing your knowledge, for asking good questions. And um, I think they deserve a little applause. Thank you. Thank you.